everybody, and welcome uh, to a brand new episode of Jedi Way here on the Outlaw Nation channel. I am the Outlaw John Roca, sometimes called Roca Fed in this side of the universe, and I'm really excited to be welcoming these two people back to the show to have some fun talking about the world of Star Wars, of course. First off, we have the co-host of the Force Toast pod, uh, one of the great champions in the Star Wars uh, Schmodown universe. I mean, in terms of uh, the people's champion, for sure. She's someone people love to death and someone who people look forward to to talk about the High Republic, for God's sakes. It is the great Laura Kelly. Laura, how are you? I'm doing so great, John. Speaking of the High Republic, there is a new, um, there's a new young adult book out. Oh, is there really? Yeah, so Defy the Storm just came out like two days ago uh, when we were recording this. Or I guess it was yesterday. I'm like already 10 chapters in. I'm so excited. I'm loving it. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and of course, joining us uh, live from San Diego, California, there with uh, Kurosawa in the background. Okay. It is uh, one of the big champions of the Shmodan himself, but also a big, big Star Wars fan and a, a dear friend of mine. And that is uh, the great Kevin Smets. Whoa, oh, we got a soundboard. <laughs> We got we upgraded Jedi Way 3.0, dude. 3.14. Uh, that's a Windows reference for all you nerds out there. You know, I just thought about when we, there you go. All right, when we were talking go. about the High Republic. I'm like, how has no one done like a parody of all of the Jedi Masters getting stoned in the you know the High Republic and everybody? Oh, oh it's out there. Oof. We've already done. Okay, it's out, the logo for sure is out there with like the weed leaf. It's definitely been done. <laughs> okay, I, love it. It, at least. I love it. I love it. Good That's to see awesome. everybody. Good, to, good to talk <laughs> Star Wars. You too. You too. And at the risk of upsetting some of our fans, ladies and gentlemen, I will be leading some of these topics. I hope that's okay. Don't get mad in the comment section. Uh, I just want to make it clear. We're just uh, uh, there. The, Kevin and Laura, a little bit more busier than I am. So I was able to kind of come up with some of this stuff and, and present it. So we will be going with all the topics. We're going to talk about some stuff going on in the world of Star Wars, Turns of Steel Books. Big news about some casting possibilities going on for that Ray movie. We're going to talk about um, the sad passing of Mark Dodson, who was the voice of salacious b crumb and uh we'll get in some other stuff so the mandalorian video game that we talked about just a couple of weeks ago i guess is finito and uh, we're also going to review the last two episodes of the bad batch which will be the back end of the show uh for sure so uh, let's jump but before we jump in just want to remind you all to please subscribe to the channel hit a like on the video share it on your social media leave comments as we go along we appreciate that madly here on the jedi way let's jump into the first one here and it's the big story that dropped here that uh, there are rumors going around here from Daniel Richtman on his Patreon page. You know, Daniel uh, and I follow each other on Twitter. Certainly he's dropped scoops. We dropped scoops on the hot mic. So it's been fun to get to know Daniel. But Daniel dropped that uh, the uh, Mandalorian Grogu will not be shot exclusively in L.A. Uh, and as the cast and crew will fly to the U.K. for an unspecified time. He also uh, put rumors out there that they are looking to cast three New characters in this Ray movie. Two would be apprentices, and one would be a massive villain. So that is a big, big uh, a bunch of news being dropped here by Daniel Rickman. So you hear this story, Laura Kelly. You you hear this idea that they're not just going to shoot in Alex a lot. I saw Molly and Alex having a conversation about this on Star Wars Explained, and Molly was saying, "Well, they're just trying to get that film done quickly and get it out." Well, now if we're going to the UK. Now we start looking at the fact that maybe they are going to go on location for some of these shoots along with the volume and then see what kind of a, a movie we're going to get overall. And then these possibilities of two apprentices, so apprentices, I don't know the plural of that is, and and a villain. So what are your thoughts on this, on these uh, uh, rumors here coming out from Daniel R RPK? Well, I think the first thing that jumped out at me about the Mandalorian and Grogu movie being shot in not just California, but also in the UK was that, well, it joins the rest of the Star Wars movies because all wow. haven't all of them been shot out in the UK. So yeah, I think yeah. that, that probably makes it's a lot of sense. One. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this these California tax credits, though, allegedly that they would they would be getting for shooting in California. I think Star Wars Newsnet was questioning, you know, is are they still mm. going to get that? Um, that's not quite as important to me, but I, uh, <laughs> I, I like the idea of getting out of the volume a little bit, yeah. shooting on location somewhere. Obviously, Andor got a lot of props for not using the volume um, and for sort of being out on location and shooting outside. And we've seen a little bit of that with the Mandalorian TV show, but we haven't gotten mm. a ton. So I think letting it broaden its horizons a little bit can only be a good thing. Um, I question a little bit why they can't broaden their horizons. In California, they have to go to the UK to do it, apparently. Yeah. Um, 
but it's all good. Uh, with the Ray casting, I mean, my mind immediately went to wait is is the is one of these villains potentially Angela Bassett, which is the uh -huh. talked, and I really want her to be Ray Sloan. And I'm like, is that going to be the major villain in the Ray movie? Because I feel like that timeline would work. We don't really mm. know how old she is at any point in the timeline when she falls into a random story. Um, so I think I think theoretically it could work. Star Wars has played loosey goosey with people's ages, Bo Katan being one of them. So I would be fine with them doing it with Ray Sloan too. Um, that was my first thought. But very exciting that she's going to have two apprentices yeah. at one time. That's not something that we get with Jedi and the Republic. So I'm looking forward to that. But uh, something a little bit different. I don't know. Maybe it's not different though, Kevin. Have they had a lot of double apprentices happen in the old Republic? Is that something that you've seen before? Hmm. Uh, not, I, don't, I can't really think of it. I'm trying to, I'm just trying to figure out what the plural of apprentices is. Apprenti? <laughs> We're stuck on that. Apprenti? I got two apprenti. <laughs> well, you know, there's going to be, there'll be a rivalry with the two apprentices and, and one will Ooh. probably, uh, delve in the dark and, and then the two apprentices will have to square off. Look, I already, I already told you what wow. the plot is. You already Ask, wrote the that's That's Daniel cool. RPK. That's cool. You guys, I, I used to follow, I still do. I mean, mm. I've heard of, or I've followed Daniel RPK. I used to love all of his scoops. Yeah. With the uh, Marvel movies and stuff too. I, I'm a, I'm a sucker for those um, and the rumors and stuff, but yeah. Sure. Uh, good to see that they're, yeah, I mean, UK, if you were to compare, uh, you know, I'm not saying all of California isn't beautiful, but when you compare it to the on locations that they can do in the UK, mm. I'm sure like in Wales and the cliff sides and, all over the place. So, I mean, we, we got Fresno. No, you know, we got Fresno here. <laughs> Didn't they do the Obi Wan? It looked like Fresno anyway, the, with the oil rig and yeah. the, the gravel pit. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's, you know, Northern California and all that. I mean, they shot Return of the Jedi here, didn't they? In the, in the, in right the, near woods. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Look, as long as they're on location, uh, you know, as long as, but I just hope they shoot it. Wasn't the Robert Rodriguez episode? with Boba Fett. Ooh. They shot that outside too. And everybody was yes. like, it looks like they pulled over on the 134, you know, right, right, right next to magic mountain or whatever <laughs> in Ventura County. And they're like, all right, Boba Fett, get out there. We got it. We got daylight killing. Go, daylight go, go. <laughs> so I hope that they shoot it and they make it look like more like Andor and not too clean. I know Robert Rodriguez likes his clean stuff. I like that episode actually, but I think yeah. I'm quoting Ken Napsok. He made a funny joke about that back in the day. Shout out to mm. Ken. But yeah, uh, as long as they go on location, that's fine. The casting is exciting. Obviously, they will be a big villain. Uh, I hope it uh, Ray Sloan was cool. So I hope that it could be Ray Sloan because that would make Laura happy and that would make us happy. Mm. So um, and then, yeah, I, I do like the I, the the concept of two apprentices or apprenti as you will um and there can't obviously like you know they're gonna want to be in the favor of of ray and ray will probably undeniably uh lean towards one more than the other as as teacher and students do and so one's gonna be slighted and then maybe we'll get uh, taken under the wing of someone uh less savory so yeah yeah, I, I i got a lot of thoughts when i hear this and of course it's just rumors we don't really officially know if this is the route they're going. But, you know, Doctor Who recently tried to have more than one companion, and it really didn't work out for Jodie Whittaker in her seasons, which you could probably attribute to some of the writing and the show running during the seasons. But she was great. But it just felt weird to have more than one companion. Now, we've had two companions with the Doctor, of course, with Amy Pond and her, uh, and her husband. But, like, the idea is the rule of two, isn't it? So when you bring two apprentices... Are we talking about the rule of three? Are we talking about a Star Wars throuple? What are we talking about? Here? That's, so just, that's just the Sith, talk though. Up. But yeah, the rule of two is just the Sith. Right. Well, I hear you. Right. But we've always kind of seen, you know, Luke being trained by Obi-Wan and uh, Obi-Wan training Anakin. And yeah. so it's always, although it's never been said, right, we've kind of been conditioned. Well, it kind of has been, Roka. He does right? say, uh, oh, you, uh, apprentice you already have in Obi-Wan Remember when Qui-Gon's oh, trying right. to take on Anakin. Yeah. So you're you're right there that there is that precedent. But yeah, uh, Ray, Ray's taken over, dude. It's new, right, it's I guess new so. era. New order, right? So it's a, maybe a new approach. Uh, and maybe this is almost like, you know, you've got to go set up a, a, a Jedi Academy here. you got to go set up a Jedi Academy there. But, Kevin, you bring up an interesting point. Will they be at odds with each other because the natural desire to be favored in this whole situation? I wonder if they're going to play that route or they're going to play them as a threesome in terms of the battle sequences coming together 
her teaching them as they go through their journey of uh, of these battles and who is the big bad villain what is their role in all of this what is the what is the villain trying to do is it a sith are they trying to stop the jedi order from coming to fruition again what is the motivation there so it's going to be interesting because we know that in comics and in anything once something good pops up something bad pops up to counter it and vice versa when something bad pops up something good pops up to counter it so i'll be curious to see and as far as shooting in the uk i'm happy about that sure why not as laura pointed out so well the tradition since the first star wars movie is to shoot stuff in the uk so to go back to that old school approach i think is going to be it doesn't mean they're going to go to shepherd and studios or anything like that but the fact that they're actually going to go in the uk I think could be a lot of fun to kind of honor the tradition of Star Wars as well. So we'll see with this Ray movie, because certainly a lot of people are either anticipating it or waiting to destroy it. So we'll <laughs> see when it comes out. You know how Star Wars fans can be, especially those YouTube channels. All right, let's move on to some other news here. Um, and this is some fascinating stuff. We're talking about steel books here, ladies and gentlemen. This is Kind of fun to get this news. Did not anticipate this at all, but um, we're getting the Mandalorian. And uh, th this was uh, they, last year we got the Mandalorian, Loki, and WandaVision on 4K and Blu ray. Well, now they've announced collector's editions, uh, Blu rays of Marvel Studios and Lucasfilms uh, hits Andor, Obi Wan Kenobi, Moon Knight, and Falcon and Winter Soldier, complete with steelbook packaging. Let me bring one of those up here. That's Kenobi there that you see. Uh, complete with the steelbook packaging, as I was just saying, which I think is really exciting for sure. Uh, and all the new Disney Plus Brulee titles will be able to pre-order starting on March 12th, 12th, so just seven days or six days from now, I guess, with a release date set for April 30th. They will be priced at $54.99, although there are pre-order discounts if you want to get them. And looking at the Kenobi one, uh, you're looking at that one there. Here's the here's you get Duels of the Fate, Obi Wan versus Vader, which I imagine is a documentary. The Dark Times villains uncover the love, the lore of the deadly Inquisitors and Darth Vader's iconic look. Designing the galaxy, uh, saying hello to Leia's lovable sidekick Lola, and then a director's commentary here with uh, Deborah Chow uh, for an exclusive uh, exclusive commentary on all of that. And we move over to Andor, and Andor is going to have a number of things attached to it as well, which is fun. Ferrex Part 1, Imperial Occupation with Tony Gilroy, Kathleen Kennedy, Diego Luna. Aldani, Rebel Heist, uh, join the shoot in Scotland with character spotlights, VFX breakdown and stunts. Coruscant, Whispers of Rebellion, which will explore the stories of ISB agent Deidre, Senator Mon Mothma, and Spymaster Luthan Rail. Narkina 5, One Way Out, uncover the Empire's penal system and imprison the stark look. Get to know Kino Loy and, the view, and view the VFX breakdowns. And then Ferrex Part 2, Fight the Empire, Tony Gilroy, Diego Luna, cast and crew reveal the making of the season finale. So, Kevin, it seems like these are stacked, stacked discs to have and to own. And yes, $54.99, kind of a steep price with things that are going on in the economy nowadays, but there are discounts, and maybe these are collector's editions for people who really love both of these series. And certainly Kenobi's been growing in estimation in a lot of people's minds over the last few months. So your thoughts when you hear about this? I thought the pricing seemed pretty on point. If, when you first showed it, I was like, oh, that's got to be like a $79.99 kind of thing. Ooh. So I'm a little shocked at the price. So that's pretty good. Um, I was just looking at it, uh, the artwork alone, it seems yeah. worth it for some of that artwork alone, the Kenobi one and the Andor one. Like, yeah. Also, just, uh, you know, with the, all these uh, streaming services, I was just talking to someone that like, I was like, I never got to watch the Willow show. And I know oh. that they pulled it off Disney Plus, but I was like, well, you could probably still buy it on, uh, you know, Apple yeah. TV or whatever. Like, you know, just buy the season. Can't even do that. Yeah. So, and I don't think that these shows would ever be in danger of that. But I really, uh, it's a, that's a scary thing where you can just take something and completely wipe it off uh, memory. So, yeah. uh, to get these uh, uh, physical media is good. My only other thing is, where would you get a physical media player? Do they even have Blu-ray players anymore? I mean, I, my <laughs> Xbox and the PS5, but. I was yeah. just thinking, like, eBay. do I see these around anymore? These these players. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, the the artwork alone it looks fantastic, um, and you know the Andor one, um, especially salivating at that one. So that, yeah. that look that's going to be fantastic. What do you guys think? What do you think, yeah, Laura? Laura? Uh, you can keep Andor, but Kenobi I must have <laughs> because here's my thing. The yeah. it has my cut on it too as a special third disc, by the way. <laughs> exactly. The Mandalorian's not going anywhere from Disney Plus, right? Like some of these shows, you can just pretty much bank. Like it's going to be on Disney Plus forever. Apparently, that was not the case with Willow. I never watched it. It mm. wasn't, a, I not really up my alley. So I didn't really have any interest in watching it. But I would not be in the slightest bit surprised 
if they went to go take Kenobi off of Disney Plus someday. Whoa. So yeah. I'm not a big like physical media. I don't Ooh. feel a need to buy a lot of physical media these days, hmm. but this Kenobi one I might have to get. Also, I love director commentary. I'm all about that. So I will throw down for yeah. that any day. Um, shout out to my friend Jane, who pointed out on Twitter that oh. the Kenobi cover says the complete series. Oh, how, how dare they? That feels like an attack. I don't wow. approve. <laughs> I uh, notice that. Wow. It's so mean. So, yeah, thank you for her to uh, thank you to her for showing me that wow. because it, it ruined my day, but it also further convinced me I should probably buy this. <laughs> oh. Good point. Yeah. Wow. It does say it because Andor does not say that. Oh, it says complete first season because we know a season two. Is right. coming. This one just says complete series. Wow. <laughs> so that's, we know that's, like the, that's the that's the hidden news right there. That's like burying the lead. That's huge. Oh, true. Very true. So I didn't rude. know that. <laughs> yeah, I'll I never I, get that Reva sequel series. I'm sorry, guys. Oh, sorry, Reva fans. Yeah. Maybe no. It'll be a different series. It'll have a different title, and that'll be a different complete series. Probably just one season only as well. Yeah. Reva season one. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, I still Revenge collect with, um, physical media every once in a while. I don't buy it anywhere near the levels that I used to before. I do have a PS5, so I use that player, Kevin, so I hear what you're saying. But And I did buy one last 4K player like a three or four years ago just to have one from Sony in the house just in case, and that was before I got the PS5. So um, I hear you, though. It, 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 that, that old stuff is dying. I mean, Best Buy it barely has four racks, four shelves anymore, physical media. We hear more and more. Studios are not are not selling it anymore. And like Laura said, they're taking stuff down. They're eliminating stuff, which is a really frustrating thing for people who want to discover. I mean, that's the joy of growing up and discovering things, right? Whether you're going to the video store or paying for a streaming service, you stumble upon stuff all the time or you, people berate you enough until you finally watch a particular show because you're like, okay, fine. And then you really enjoy the hell out of it. Having this stuff disappear off these streaming services and having all those video stores shutting down uh, for the last uh, you know couple of uh, decades, you just have don't as you don't have as much access to this kind of stuff. You, you and know what's the whim of the studios, yeah. And what's yeah. kind of interesting about it and and sad, but like mm. we have those memories of like going to Blockbuster and oh, sure. getting the candy and like browsing and picking. The, like I could still in my head smell the Blockbuster, right? Right. But the, there are there are generations now that are adults that are are fully head of households yeah. that uh, make the financial decisions they don't have those memories so right. they're not missing that there's no there's not that feeling of oh my gosh they're missing out on what they used to have they've never had that experience so yeah. when yeah. they're seeing these shelves disappear they're like oh no, yeah they, it doesn't even affect them you know what right I mean? and i don't say that as a negative i'm just saying oh. that is just a consequence of like uh how some people weren't alive when you ever had to set your VCR, right? Like they've right, just been knowing yeah. the DVR. It's crazy. That's how it is. I mean, I grew up at a time when you couldn't even set your D your v VCR. You had to sit there and hit play record right as the thing was starting oh, wow. or else you weren't going to get it at all. Yeah. I mean, I'm, were the TVs yeah. color back then or was no, it? Like yeah. <laughs> real funny. I love that. I appreciate that. <laughs> Hair still black, son. The hair still black. <laughs> you can't come for me yet. I can't but say no, the I same. Hear you. No, you're right. You're right. I mean, that's the thing with that is is you missed it. But but I love that they're putting effort into these physical media when they put it out, right? I mean, it's just as you said, uh, the artwork there, Kevin, and the design, the look of it all, uh, and all these extra features. They aren't just screwing you over by putting it out again in a steel book and like there's one 15 minute or 10 minute video there's a lot as as laura pointed out the director's commentaries which would be interesting to get a better idea of what deborah chow was thinking when she was doing these things and certainly so many people have speculated on youtube videos what a director is thinking without having watched any of director's commentaries on these things so it's great to see that being an element of this so yeah but uh 54.99 but there are discounts so when those uh, they but they had amazon links to these but they're not up there yet so i, I wonder if that was just to put it up there and we'll see in the future when they actually come down um all right let's move on to a little bit of some sad news we should talk about this and um uh this is mark dodson who uh sadly passed away uh, at the very young age of 64 i mean 64 isn't that isn't doesn't seem that distant anymore and so when you hear 64 you're like wow really 
Uh, and he was supposed to be appearing at the Evansville Horror Con. So this was a weekend where people were expecting to see him at the Indiana Fan Convention there. And sadly, he passed away. No, de- uh, no cause of death was given. And he started his voice acting career uh, voicing Salacious B. Crumb there on Star Wars Return of the Jedi. And he gave an interview back in 2020 talking about how he got on to the project. And he was actually auditioning for Admiral Akbar, but was so nervous that he asked for a break to compose himself. And when he was then overheard using this deranged voice to kind of get his voice back on track to do Akbar, the casting director heard him and thought he was perfect to play Salacious B. Crumb. And then later he was cast to voice several of the Magwai uh, in Gremlins, uh, which of course came out in 1984 as well, and continued to work in the Ewoks Battle for Endor, Gremlins 2. He even voiced a scavenger in Star Wars The Force Awakens. Uh, he was also an uncredited zombie in George Romero's Day of the Dead way back in the 1980s there. Um, and so, yeah, sadly, passing away, he auditioned to do E.T., didn't get it uh, there um, uh, for that. So just a, a fantastic guy with a great legacy here. When you look at him, he also voiced uh, some uh, characters in Darkwing Duck and Barkers, uh, Star Trek stuff, uh, uh, Star War, uh, and the Lego Star Wars. So a big, big part of the Star Wars franchise uh, and a sad passing there. Uh, Laura, you can't. I don't know. You didn't start with the original trilogy, so when you go back and you see a character like Salacious B. Crumb, and we did see that that species pop up recently in the Mandalorian season, uh, what are your thoughts when you think about Mark Dodson's work here as a voiceover guy uh, through numerous projects? I mean, I see his IMDb, and it just goes on and on yeah. and on. Um, and you're right. I didn't. I didn't grow up with the original trilogy, so I was an adult when I watched Return of the Jedi. Um, and it still, to this day, is my favorite of the original trilogy. So oh, wow. I'm still okay. a child at heart. I still. Uh, I fully approve of Salacious P. Crumb. <laughs> um, I, I hope that somebody has checked on uh, Claire Stribling on Twitter because she is a massive Salacious P. Crumb fan. So oh, yeah. I'm feeling for her today. But Mark Dodson was a Midwest boy. It looks like he grew. He uh, was born in St. Louis, and it sounds like he lived a lot of his life uh in evansville indiana so Mm -hmm. we love a classic midwest guy he uh it it does say that his daughter told tmz uh on deadline that he suffered a heart attack oh no okay i'm sorry i was reading the new york times biography which didn't list it but okay it was a heart attack ah yeah that's a shame uh for sure um well what are your thoughts here when you think about uh mark dodson uh kevin i know you enjoy voiceover work very much you're an actor yourself so what are your thoughts when you hear about his passing yeah, I mean, uh, when I, especially when I was younger and I did a lot of voiceover work, it was very, like, kind of close, like, small knit. Like, a mm. lot of people would know each other. Like, I was on Bobby's World and I was only really on mm. Bobby's World. And then, like, when people would come in, though, like, everybody knew everyone. I used to sit next yeah. to Rob Paulson every day, which was fantastic. Wow. Rob Paul, I would sit between Rob Paulson and Frank Welker as a kid. And as a kid, I didn't understand the power or how awesome that was. But yeah. Right. Um, so anyone who has like such a legacy like that, um, like like Laura said, like her his IMDb just goes goes on and goes on. So to quote Luke, like no one's ever really gone. So um, it's very sad. And yeah, you, you hear the heart heart attack. That's always a scary thing. So yeah, uh, you never know. That's why you never know when uh, when your time is up. So try to kind of you know especially coming from me, a cancer survivor, like you never know when someone's going to say, Hey, uh, yeah, yeah, th- this, this might be it for you. So yeah. really I implore everybody to kind of live their life and, uh, be as, you know, to chase happy things and try not to focus on the negative and the toxic stuff. And I know in this space, especially there's a lot of that toxicity. And, mm. you know, when you see someone pass away like that, you kind of just kind of brings it all, um, to focus like maybe that's not th- the thing that we should be focusing our time on we should be focusing our time on celebrating all these great artists work and craft so yeah rest in peace my friend yeah absolutely uh, echo your sentiments both your sentiments for sure and uh you know you want to leave a legacy and if you're an actor and you voice over some legendary characters that's leaving a legacy and of course a sad passing seemed like it was a really jovial guy a lot of pictures seemed to enjoy the fans talking with the fans, enjoying uh, reliving those days. Um, And a lot of people seemed, from what I saw online, to have a lot of memories of talking with him at these conventions and how great he was with them. And so, you know, you love that there's a a very strong member of the the community that loves the fans 
Uh, and it's always sad when he pa- when one passes away like this. So it's a shame. But, you know, Salacious B. Crumb will live on forever and will be passed on from generations to generations and the Gremlins as well and a lot of his other work. So uh, we'll <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Big, uh, big, I like that Salacious Crumb had a middle initial, too, by the way. <laughs> I know, right? Salacious B. Crumb. One of the few. <laughs> All right, let's hit one last story before we take a break and jump into these uh, 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 reviews of the Bad Batch last two episodes here. we got to talk about the Mandalorian video game. That's right, the Mandalorian video game, which we just talked about two weeks ago. Um, it uh, Respawn employees were not told that the Star Wars Mandalorian game that they were working on was being canceled until the absolute last moment. This was being done by EA, EA and Respawn. Entertainment fans have blamed the publisher, but sources claim the owner was responsible and the cancellation was part of Bob Iger's mission uh, to control the entertainment industry. That's what they were thinking here. Um, But uh, this is a a part of all the layoffs and a part of the decisions being done here uh, by and the cost cutting being done by Star Wars uh, and uh, their parent company, obviously Disney. Uh, So it's a shame at the end of the day, we're not going to get this uh, Mandalorian video game that seemed like it was going to be an open world game. As I said last time we talked about this, we had seen the Star Wars Outlaw stuff and it would look really cool. A Mandalorian open world game would have been a lot of fun. So clearly we're seeing some of these projects be victims of Iger's cost cutting there at Disney, which he's trying to make it a lean, mean machine for sure. So, uh, you know, you hear this thoughts. uh, What do you say there, Kevin? Uh, What's your feeling on this one? I mean, I think we were all, I mean, anything they announce these days, you just never know. I mean, the, yeah. the whole the KOTOR remake, the same thing that it's been going on. And, oh, is it canceled? Is it not? So when, when we see this Mandalorian one, it just felt so much like Outlaws anyway that, like, yeah. to me, I mean, from what I remember from the panel that I slept through uh, <laughs> at Comic Con, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a bummer. I mean, I don't, I, I'm not going to put too much mental thought on it because, like, mm. there's so many. It's just, aren't we all tired of so many things being announced for Star Wars and being canceled? Like, sure. it's almost becoming a joke. I think there was a list. I think we talked about it once. Like, yeah. it's crazy how long this list is of things that were canceled, both in all media, video games, yeah. books, comics, anything. So, yeah, it's a bummer. It's a bummer for all that work on it. Um, I can't imagine working on something and it, beca- it can become such a labor of love and then th- for them to pull the rug on it. I worked on a show once about a uh, a football, like minor league football uh, players in mm. Jersey and New York. It's this rivalry. And we edited it like hard knocks, but it was very funny and comedic and stuff. But when there was a merger that took place, the network, the new regime was like, yeah, we don't want the show. So it's work that i did for the lot for like three months will never air it's just it it's probably hanging out with that girl somewhere no. and it's on such a small a small minor level but like for these people that worked on it i feel bad for them because like here they are working so hard on something and they're probably really proud of it it's probably really awesome right like yeah, early yeah. builds and for it to get taken away like that I, I my heart bleeds for them so i hope hopefully they land on their feet and they get some other work you know yeah yeah for sure Laura, your thoughts on this? I mean, as Kevin said, things being canceled in the Star Wars universe seems to be uh, their MO for the last few years. Uh, Were you surprised by this announcement, uh, considering how people were getting excited about it just two weeks ago and how quickly it was uh, cut? No Star Wars cancellations surprise me anymore, to be honest, uh, like uh, Kevin alluded to. But, you know, lots of layoffs are happening right now yeah. in tech in particular. So I'm not terribly surprised that EA and Respawn would be participating in that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, on the upside, these things are cyclical, cyclical. So unemployment rises and falls with the economy. You never know. Maybe this will get resurrected someday. Sounds like they made some decent progress on it. So I imagine it could be easily picked up again. Um, we talked about this a little bit on Force Toast this past episode, okay. and one of the other things that came up in relation to this is that Lucasfilm Animation is hiring right now. They're hiring uh, mid-level animators, I believe. Wow. So I think that post is is somewhere out there on the internet, I imagine, unless they've filled positions and closed it since we recorded last mm-hmm. Friday. Oh, okay. So you're yeah, ba- kind of balancing things out a little bit, maybe. Uh, for the Star Wars universe overall. Yeah, I was looking forward to this one. You know, I'm kind of getting back into video games slowly. Don't get me slowly. Getting back into these games because they're very intense and time-consuming. So um, I just got the Suicide Squad game the other day because F it, why not? Let's see if it's any good. But uh, I was looking for, I'm looking forward to Star Wars Outlaws and I was looking at this Mandalorian one too to see what we're going to get. But unfortunately, 
We may old not school. Get, oh, look at that. This is what I do. I, I got the old Wow. School. Those are the old Look days. at that thing. <laughs> if, when Damn. my daughter wants the Xbox 10 or whatever it's going to be, in order to get it, she'll have to play, you know, the top 25 <laughs> games of all time and beat at least the first level. So, oh, yeah. you want the Xbox? You got to beat Super <laughs> Mario Brothers level 1-1. You got to beat a level of Pac-Man. You got to respect the past. This is the work these uh, buttons, uh, there's so many things you got going on. I, I can't even. <laughs> I just watched the long plays. I'm fine. I'm satisfied. <laughs> this, will, this will come at me if my TV was in color, for God's sakes. Anyway. Um... <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Throwing stones from a glass house. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens. And as Laura said, who knows? It could be revived. Wasn't, wasn't Stashwick, wasn't Todd Stashwick working on a video game himself like years ago? And then it got kind of shelved and it was a bit of a sad one i feel like people might feel a little sad about this one as well so it's a shame overall but we'll take a quick break here and uh we're going to jump into these bad batch uh reviews uh and have a conversation about episodes four and five of season three here uh right after this oh i should you know what yeah Got some break music. What's this? Don't forget about the Outlaw Nation. Subscribe down below. Hit the like button. Leave a comment for everything I got going on. That sounds like going to be I'm live not. here. It's uh, Jedi Way tonight. Sounds like some out of the cantina. Um, <laughs> one of the ones you don't go into. Um, all right. Well, let's jump into these uh, uh, two episodes here. Episodes four and five um, of season three uh, of The Bad Bash. A lot of stuff uh, to discuss here, um, especially as we go into four and five. The first three episodes kind of laying everything down here and then getting into what we got in these last two episodes. I'm just going to connect them and ask you all questions about the overall storylines here. We had uh, Omega and Crosshair finally escape Mount Tantus, meet up with the um, meet up with Hunter and Wrecker there on the planet. And then this last episode, uh, adventure against the uh, against this ice, against the same uh, what snow worm on the heels of Dune 2 coming out, a snow worm there that they were fighting to get some information about, uh, maybe finding out where Mount Tantus is. But we get Hunter and Crosshair doing the dude thing where you kind of give each other looks and don't quite talk. And then something really big happens and opens you up and gets you vulnerable. And now you can talk about it. So Laura, what are your thoughts over these last two episodes? Did you enjoy these last two episodes? Did you enjoy the storylines we got with Omega kind of coming in and try to put everything together? And then the crew reuniting so quickly here early on in the season. What are your thoughts on this so far? I'm loving Crossroads or cross Crossroads Crosshairs <laughs> Road it. to Redemption. That's a lot um, yeah. of cross crossing. The uh, <laughs> I'm really enjoying it. I think uh, he's. I love having him as like sort of the heart of this first half of this season. Mm. Um, the there's a line that Hunter has somewhere at the end of this uh, of episode five that makes me question a little bit if he's going to survive this series. Ooh. I question a lot who I don't think all of them will survive, but I yeah. I don't know if I would have put him down as being one of them to go out. But yeah, that conversation they have at the very end where he's just like, oh, you know, who knows? There might be hope for us yet. I'm like, oh, that sounds that yeah. sounds just a little bit like doom. Um, but yeah, th do we think this was on purpose? The trip, the, the release of this timing of this episode <laughs> with Dune, I, I feel like it was, it was that, that's, that's a weird coincidence to happen, honestly. Um, but yeah, I'm very much enjoying this season so far. I really liked these last two episodes. Um, this most recent episode, episode five, the return was yeah. written by Amanda Rose Munoz. Okay. Um, who has done a lot of work at Lucasfilm, mostly in like script coordination and script stu supervision right. on Star Wars Rebels, on Star Wars Resistance. So she's done, a, she's gotten a couple of other, I think, writing credits on this show, but kind of exciting to see somebody sort of coming up through the ranks um, and getting a writing credit on this show. That's, uh, yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. I'm just happy for her. Absolutely. Uh, Ezra Nachman wrote uh, A Different Approach, which is the one before this one, uh, the return there and both of those I, I thought uh, Kevin both of these episodes could have easily been adventure of the week kind of episodes and maybe kind of pushed aside the uh, fourth episode a little bit slower as we see 
Crosshair and Omega in their dueling philosophies play themselves out here uh, as they're trying to get off this planet and get to where they're going. Uh, and then we see them reunite and see Crosshair have those kind of uh, that unspoken confrontation with the guys. And then later, this episode, previous episode, this episode we just finished, uh, we see them navigating this as dude clones, dude bros might navigate this <laughs> with the kind of the silent treatment, dirty looks at each other. Um, what did you think about all of this over these uh, uh, last two episodes? I was hoping that Valentine and Earl would show up and have a plan to get rid of this worm. That's a Tremors reference for anybody <laughs> who loved Tremors, the greatest movie of all time. Shout out PJ Campbell. Is, is um, that Kevin Bacon and Michael Gross? Is that who you named the character? No, no, no. I, na I named uh, Kevin Bacon and the other guy, uh, Fred. Fred, 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 yeah. Yeah. Valentine and Earl. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, Michael Gross. He was in every sequel afterwards. But yes, yeah, um, I'll, I'll I'll speak with. The, uh, let me just kind of keep my thoughts in order here. So episode four was good. I got vibes of like The Last of Us. You know what I mean? Like Ooh. or True yeah. Grit. Like you had them together and it was like he's like the, you know, crusty old man and grumpy and, and she's like still caring for him and stuff like that. I really like that dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, her being good at gambling, I know I see online theories that it's because she has the force or at least a mm. little bit of it. So that's an interesting theory if we're ever going to find out if if, if by, by the end. I mean, I think someone on our Twitter tagged us, Laura. Is this someone who, who they said they think that the last scene is going to be the doll being placed on her grave? Very much oh like in Logan. God. Oh. So if she doesn't live, but before the end, before she dies, she makes something shake or move. So we knew that she had force powers. But yeah, someone on Twitter made me almost cry on Twitter. It was like, oh, it's going to be Wrecker putting the doll on the grave of Omega in the last last scene of the episode of the series in that nice planet. Um, but yeah, so that whole uh, True Grit style, like the, the the Last of Us vibes, I like that. Um, yeah. And you're right; it could those both episodes could have felt like an adventure of the week, but they did a yeah. good job of like really tying it together, like threading it together. And it's it's a lot easier when you're not be having someone, uh, you know, Carla from Cheers giving you your mission at the beginning of every episode <laughs> and, and, and reconvening us afterwards. But yeah, and then yeah, the uh, the second episode, or and I like the Jurassic Park kind of nod to the Galama. Gallimimus, all those creatures that were running that was cool yeah. and then yeah it, it is so funny i was gonna say the same thing laura like the co it's coincidence that it's just this giant worm creature episode right <laughs> and uh but yeah and i really you know not to undercut everything else the the interplay between hunter and um i just like when wrecker goes and hugs them both at the end like oh, yeah. that, yes that, like Oh. That like warms the heart, right? Like I liked that, the reunion was great in episode four when they all got together and then they cliff awesome. hang on him walking down. Yeah. And then, but I do like when, when Re Wrecker just doesn't care, he's hugging them both. And then the the line from Echo made me laugh where he was like, see, like normally there's blood. So that's progress. Like that's some brothers. <laughs> they fight and they, they kind of make up, you know? So yeah. um, I was very, uh, yeah, I was entertained by both episodes and yeah, I'm interested. How many episodes are left? Ooh. There's 16 this season, okay. and oh, I think wow. this was five. So, was five, yeah. yeah. Um, I did to have to go back and rewatch The Outpost immediately oh, yeah. after finishing this because they, the snow planet is Barton 4, right. um, where Crosshair's sort of his very big episode of season two is yeah. set where he uh, and May Day go on their little adventure of the week and it ends yeah. tragically. That's the so helmet, right? That helmet yeah. that he picks yeah. up with the, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So it was nice to see them bring that back and, and return to this place and put yeah. Crosshair back in there and then have us kind of get to see his reaction um, to being back in this place where he experienced such trauma. Um, I really enjoyed that. But yeah, I felt I very much felt the need to go back and rewatch that episode. And damn, that is a good episode of this show. <laughs> episode 12 of season two of The Outpost. It's worth a revisit. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, a lot of people felt that was the best episode of the season, of season two. So that's totally understandable. You got to revisit it for sure. Um, yeah, I, I liked I liked both things that were happening. As, as an older dude watching, uh, you know, been through the wars with other guys and your friends and your brothers, and some you've lost along the way from fights and battles and just moving on, and to others who've stayed with you. I mean, Vogel and I have been friends for 25 years, which is really kind of insane, or actually maybe almost close to 28 which is kind of crazy to think about. And we've been through a lot of battles, uh, no blood, but we've been through a lot of battles and, and <laughs> arguments. And yeah, you've had that where you go and do stuff. You don't talk to each other. And then eventually 
something happens and it causes you to talk. And the the wrecker moment you talk about is so perfect. Just because he's like, all right, you guys, you guys were ignoring. I mean, the fact that he was the one where Hunter was like, I don't know if we should have given him his weapon. And Wrecker's like, uh, look, Omega says he's fine, so he's fine. So he's the one that's kind of making each one serves their purpose. Echo telling them to stop fight. We got bigger things to worry about. Wrecker kind of pushing Hunter in that direction to make amends with with Crosshair and Omega doing her part, although a little bit pushy in trying to make Crosshair have this resolution because you shouldn't be pushed into a resolution of closure with somebody. Certainly somebody can request it, but it seemed like Omega was pushing a little bit because she wanted her, her people to get back together, which is understandable. Um, you, when they finally had the conversation, I thought it was really cool. And I like that, that it's very human. It's very real what you would see between these uh, characters and how they'd go about it. Some people might feel cheated that this didn't drag on for four episodes and sniping at each other. But I think this is a smart way to go. And this makes me think that we're headed to some really big action stuff coming over the next few episodes. Because it seems like they're not wasting any time this season. Every episode has importance. Every episode has some meaning whether it's between the clones or some or the stuff with Mount Tantus, because they got more information in this previous episode. But I do think that the fourth episode was great to have the Omega philosophy of wanting to go back and save these clones. There's there's something about her that is so good that she does what's right. And it can get annoying. It can get frustrating to people who watch the show, but she's not going to be a great person. She's very clear about what she is. And you have Crosshair, as you mentioned earlier, Laura, Crosshair in this place of transition. They've essentially removed what he had always had as a foundation, raised as an assassin, raised to think about himself, to protect himself, and whoever is part of his crew, he'll protect because that's just part of his crew. But now he's got the Empire. He's betrayed by the Empire, which he talks about with Hunter at the end. And, and now, finally, he's back together with his people from a different place. They're all scarred. They're all hurt. They all have trauma from what they've experienced at the hands of the Empire, and that's what unifies them in a different way than they were unified when we first got to know them. So I love that there's this really interesting uh, emotional arc that's happening with all these clones. Um, am I off base on this, Laura? No, I don't think you are at all. I'm really mm. enjoying this journey with them. Um, I think that anybody who might continue to be questioning Crosshair, and if there's any mm. way he might backtrack in any way um talking really just to hunter in this situation <laughs> i think you just look to batcher batcher is dogs are the best judge of character all right in any point. situation and batcher is all over crosshair yeah. all the time and he even is like there's one scene where he's sitting next he's sitting between batcher and hunter and he's like petting her and i just get so much joy out of Batcher as a character just alone but the fact that she's got this really cute closeness and relationship with Crosshair just warms my heart to no end I love it um yeah. one thing I want to point out about episode four sure. um so we don't move on from it too quickly no, no. there's a scene at the very end um and again I talked about this on Force Toast and then I've got I don't have any theories but I think it's interesting Ooh. that when they're on the planet Lao Hemlock and his troopers are examining the crash shuttle site and yeah. he informs a trooper, a commander to notify all of their operatives that they are searching for Omega in the crosshair. And I am just very curious to see how that plays out mm. and potentially connects to some of the characters that we know are going to Here be comes Merrick. Here comes Merrick, dark side Ezra. <laughs> there it is. That's exactly what I was talking. No, that's not what I was, not who I was referring to, but you never know. <laughs> Maybe he'll show up as an operative. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't want to glaze past that too quickly. because I'm like, Ooh, this might come back. And yeah, there I mean, are, that one cool looking a... one, right? There's yes. that cool looking dark trooper thing. We haven't yeah. seen Fennec Shand yet either. So um, what role is she going to play when that, when these operatives get uh, activated to go after Omega and what have you? So yeah, that's going to be curious to see down the road. What did you think, just to stay there too, Laura, and, and your thoughts on this, Kevin, as well. I mean, Hemlock bought Nalise's explanation for now. So how much time has she really bought herself in this situation because she answered quickly she was on she was on point with this and said well false positives happen all the time it doesn't necessarily mean so how much time can she bide in this situation before eventually 
he doesn't need her anymore because he's got essentially um, Omega's sister there to handle these experiments and do all this stuff. So he might even trust her more because that was the first time the blood actually got run uh, that he and got results. So what are your thoughts on this? Do you think this is going to lead to the end of Nala Say as well? I don't like her chances, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. Um, and I that might be my sort of only complaint about these two episodes is that mm. op- episodes is that there's not enough on Tantus. I would yeah. be curious to sort of catch up with Nalase and Hemlock a little bit more thoroughly, but I also understand how you don't want to stop the episode because there was great momentum in especially in episode yeah. five. Yeah. So I was I'm I'm fine with they didn't that they didn't, but I am missing Tantus a little bit because I just want to know what's happening. I want to know what's in the vault. I want to know. <laughs> if there's any kind of like bonding that will happen potentially between Emery and Nala say, because oh, yeah. they both have sort of Omega as like a tie right, to yeah. them. So I just wonder if there's going to be a team up there. That's kind of the only hope that I have for Nala yeah. say, because last we saw her hemlock just left her in a cell. Yeah. And as far as we know, yeah. she's still just hanging out there. Um, but I think that Emery might be her only hope in that situation. If we have, if she's got any hope of getting out of there alive, it'll, probably be through emory yeah what are your thoughts on this kevin i hope emory kind of turns i felt like she was so like cruel to like like if you if i saw my own little clone i would be like so nice to it and she was so cruel for a while but she right? brings the doll back she brings she the, does doll bring back the doll to back, back. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah she's i know she's facing with her higher ups it's probably really everything is monitored anyway but yeah uh, yeah, I mean, Nala say the big what if is if Nala say and Yarl Poof ever met and crossed paths, maybe they could have had a love romantic because they both have long necks, right? So they can yeah. kiss. <laughs> Come on, it was, that was no one thought about Yarl Poof if he would have gone to Camino hilarious to, on a Tinder date, space <laughs> Tinder date. No, but yeah, um, I, I don't I don't like Nala say's chances either. Um, but man, who knows, you know. It can go several ways. It can go that Logan way where it's Omega's gravestone at the end, or they could really go like, you know, Disney animation way where Nala Se and Emery, they both get out of there. And the final mm. scene of the series will be everybody together living on that space paradise planet. Right. What's the name of that planet? Pabu. Pabu. Right. Yeah. Pabu. Yeah. Maybe that, maybe that's what's going to happen. So uh, then the, everybody gets there happily ever after minus one or two. So yeah, yeah I, I just think she's, she's buying herself sometime, but not a lot. And yeah, that clock's ticking. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. but yeah. what a brave character to do that uh, under such circumstances. Yeah, I had a feeling as I was watching the episode, I want to come back to something Laura said um, about uh, Hunter maybe not making it out. I've become convinced that Crosshair is not going to make it out. I think that has to, I get kind mm. of emotional thinking about it because like this is a guy that we've seen arguably the most interesting arc in the whole um, three, two seasons and a half that we've yeah. gotten of the Bad Batch has been his arc um, because it's been tragic that he went that route. It's been frustrating. It's been angering because we care about this character and we hate that he was on the other side. And now that he's on this side, there's a lot of sympathy for this character because he's broken in a lot of ways. And it reminds me of people who served in the military and gone to war. And we've talked about, you know, people who've done, read books on and study their history on what happened to a lot of Vietnam veterans when they came back feeling betrayed by their government, betrayed by the people they had put faith in, how they reacted to all of this and how they adapted to it and how they had a lot of trauma, a lot of mental health issues. And we see Crosshair is, you know, damaged in the way. He still relies on that biting wit of his and that sharp tongue as a defense mechanism but underneath it all, there's a lot of damage that needs to be repaired. And I think you saw him where he was willing to maybe leave Omega behind in episode four. In episode five, he's much more open to her, much more open to receiving her attachment. And what you said earlier about uh, Batcher, which of course is a, a pet name for the Batch, Bad Batch fans, um, he's he was going to leave Batcher as well. And here's Batcher in episode five, like licking his hand and take, so you see him, he is a different crosshair. He's opening up. Um, so it's about love. It's about care. It's about affection. It's about showing that this person matters and that their viewpoints are important and their respect is there. And so for me as a military guy, watching this angle of it, um, I was really moved by that at the end of the fifth episode with him and Hunter and them having them come that conversation. They have, Later on, an echo, you know, saying it, as you said, Kevin, that sweet line he said about, at least there was in blood, it's progress. There's genuine affection there within all the clones. So I think they're doing that on purpose story-wise so that when they die, you're going to feel that, uh, if any of them yeah. die. 
And I feel might like I, also, because might I add that you yeah. said such beautiful words there, Roka, and as mm. did you, Laura. And I was talking about Yarl Poof and, and Nama like, <laughs> getting together. Yarl Poof Nama, matters too, okay? <laughs> we got to have balance on the show, Cap. Come on. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I could see, yeah. I mean, you know, they always say the golden rule too is like, you know, the he talks about all oh, he the mistakes he's made and he's done some yes. atrocities, like that. Yeah. I think that he feels that he like he'll have to pay for that. And in the end, yep. maybe it is more uh fitting that he's the one that will pay for those mistakes. But in a final grand, you know, yes. sacrifice that he'll do to save his comrades that he let down. And yeah, yeah I mean, goosebumps just thinking about it. So yeah, yeah. but that's I'm every like redemption. That's every redemption in Star Wars. They never actually get to like True. live out the redemption, and mm. just once. <laughs> what would oh Vader do if he lived out that Please. redemption? He would have spent the rest of his days in a cell. I don't hey, know. Like... Maybe not. You oh no, it's know, okay. But... You're forgiven for murdering all those countless civilians. <laughs> no, he would be in jail. He would face the Nuremberg trials. He uh, would be horrible. True. He would absolutely face the Nuremberg oh, trials. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's so probably some true. of these but guys got to go, man. I wasn't Anakin aware. knew what he was doing, man. He was like, I, will, right, I am going to go back and rewatch rewatch this episode with that lens, John, because I think that hmm. that's really interesting. I did not read that at all. I feel like I was taking away from it, like, oh, look at this bond that's formed between Crosshair and Omega. Hmm. Like they could act like, what if they go on? Like if the two yeah. of them live and like team up, like think about what they could be doing across the galaxy in right. the future. I like cool. that. I, I kind of have trouble seeing Hunter in something like that mm. because he's been sort of that essential father figure right. for her. I am just, I don't know. I'm not sure yeah. about, I don't like his odds at this point where we are, totally, but totally yeah. Fair. Yeah, he, he could he could be the one that makes the big sacrifice for the whole crew because he's always that's what a leader does in moments that are critical and has to. Uh, but I also kind of see him and Wrecker as like Seven Samurai, where it's it's uh, uh, oh god, uh, Takashi Shimura and his friends surviving, saying, "Hey, we did it again. Somehow we survived again." Uh, where uh, amongst all the mounds uh, uh, of the graves of the other samurai who didn't, so. I wonder how the end result's going to be. And you know what's great? The fact that we don't know and the fact that we're excited to see, but also tr uh, have a bit of trepidation to see what's going to happen because we're, we're scared about who might go means that they've started out the right way with this season. They've made us really yeah. kind of care about these uh, clones fully again and invested in what's going to happen to them as we go along over the next 11 episodes here uh, finishing out season three uh any final words anything we missed anything you know the music cues were great anything that you guys want to highlight that we didn't talk about in these two episodes if you do some digging i forget i don't have the name sorry it escapes hmm. me but there's a great video if you just search uh crosshair theme music musical themes on these last two episodes oh. there's a lot of hints about um where he could be going or where his loyalties are and how his theme pops up in a certain way when he's when, with the reunion and stuff like that and i always like deep dive musical things unfortunately mm -hmm. i'm sure that gives uh that helps no one and me just saying search <laughs> the youtube for it but yeah uh it I, I do appreciate the music Kevin Kiner has and it's multi-layered. And I think that it's by design when you hear his, you know, his badass theme sometimes, and then his like, hmm. work, like sad theme later uh, other times. So yeah. we'll see where that goes. Uh, Laura, any final things? There's a really funny scene in episode four where the ship exhaust blows the stormtrooper just sends them flying backwards. Oh, yeah. It's just hysterical. It makes me laugh out loud every time I watch it. Yeah, I just He's like ducking the whole time too, right? And then he gets <laughs> stands up right at the worst. <laughs> it's What's so that? dumb, but it's so funny. Yeah. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, you saw the ice vulture again in episode five, and that ice uh. vulture was there in the outpost. A lot of people have written some interesting articles about what the ice vulture, what a vulture represents. It either represents death and decay or it represents rebirth, a new life because of what Ooh. they, uh, the vulture uh, um, serves in the ecosystem uh, there um, with what they do. So Ooh. interesting stuff, kind of like what we have with, um, with Ahsoka and the owl. You've got the ice vulture now with Crosshair, which makes so much sense for God's sake. So interesting. Um, yeah, look that up, Kevin. It's actually a fun, fun read. Some of these articles about that, uh, the symbolism of it all. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for this episode of the Jedi way. We appreciate you all madly. Thanks for watching. Thanks for clicking like, thanks for leaving a comment. Hope you subscribe down below and hit that bell button. Laura Kelly, another fun show with you. Please let people know where they can find you and all you got going on. 
Sure. Come find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram. I am at shut up underscore Laura. I'm much more active on Twitter, although these days I'm not particularly active there either. Uh, but I'm on both places. I am reachable there. And you can listen to my podcast that I host with my friend Alice called Force Toast, a Star Wars happy hour, where we drink wine and talk about Star Wars. That's on Twitter at Force Toast Pod. Right on. And Kevin, another fun show with your brother. The lights have gone down on Coruscant. What are your, uh, <laughs> please let people know where they can find you and what you got going on. Yeah, you could find me at Kev Smets right down there. It's been very busy lately uh, in my personal life and work, so I haven't really been able to do too much on the KOTOR front or even Scoundrels Inc. However, I am making my first appearance in we like many weeks on Scoundrels Inc. this week. Nice. So uh, if you want to tune in there, you can uh, join myself and Frank Janis, Frankie Numbers, and uh, fan of the fan of the show. So um, other than that, um, yeah, it's always good talking. Uh, like I said, I've had a couple stressful weeks so it's always nice like always coming into recording i'm like oh man how am i going to talk about star wars but it kind of all that melts away within minutes uh talking to you too so i appreciate that thank it's you well, same much love to you both and i always appreciate talking Star Wars with you guys uh and i'm always honored that you're willing to do the show every two weeks to have fun talking about this stuff because like it's a nice respite from all the other stuff this is fun fun show to do with you all and for all of you listening and watching us it's a fun it's fun to have you all aboard uh, as well. All right, let's uh, get on out of here. Y'all take care of yourselves. Have wait, a wait, 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 Laura. What do there we you have go? You got to make sure we don't forget <laughs> you know the line. I'm never going to forget again. Why are you hating on Qui Gon, dude? Come on. It's okay. You will forget again. But <laughs> until you do, always remember that your focus determines your reality.